Rayla's experiences ultimately overwhelm her preconceived sense of self, and she has to decide how to handle that disruption in Season 5 of The Dragon Prince. Rayla has learned with pain and agony, perhaps, but learned nonetheless. The truth that experience, as Montaigne and Emerson discuss, is fundamentally destructive. That does not mean it's bad, but it's destructive. It overwhelms our abstract preconceived notions of the good and the just. It overwhelms our preconceived notions of who we are and what we want for ourselves. All of these abstract concepts that we carry with us from day to day and believe with the intensity of the most pious believer are ultimately insufficient to encompass the amorphous protean rush of experience. They might be okay for day-to-day -day life as long as we don't look too closely at what these actual experiences and sensations produced by day-to-day -day life are, but for the grand moments in our lives, these staggering, harrowing experiences that overwhelm and overflow and surpass our sense of self and leave us feeling the inadequacy of that basic sense of self-concept, it leads to a sense of crisis. And that is what Rayla is in right now, a sense of crisis. I do not mean she's doomed, but she is in a position where she has to reconsider what she feels and how committed she is to the concept she has constructed for her own sense of identity. She has realized that as much as she discussed being willing to change, being willing to open up, being willing to commit to Callum, change is not that easy. This is one thing that Season 4, whatever its faults, does very well. It demonstrates the difficulty of real, lasting change. It's alright to have these idealistic, heroic hopes of overthrowing past prejudices and divisions and creating a more unified and more peaceful world, but these divisions remain. They're fissures going down into the depths of our psyches. We might build a bridge over them, but the gaps still remain. Rayla realizes that, it seems. She leaves, completely severs that relationship with Callum, that relationship that has meant so much to the both of them and enabled them to be their best selves, and her entire quest is in vain. She is technically correct that Viren is not really, really dead, and he's certainly not dead now. But she couldn't track him down. Even with all her skills, even with all her expertise, she just comes back in a state of embarrassment, shame, despondency. She expects to see Callum just as she left him. But of course, that's not how people work. Experience teaches us such. The self is in a constant state of evolution. It is in a constant state of flux. It constantly moves and twists like a flame in response to circumstances, in response to what it believes is most fitting and most appropriate to new sensations and new experiences. Callum, having gone through the brutal experiences of losing Rayla, is ultimately in a much more sorrowful state, a much more somber state, a much more melancholy state. Above all, he can't really trust people like he once did. One of my favorite moments in Season 4 is just in the very first episode, when everyone else is celebrating, everyone else is happy, everyone else has moved on. Perhaps a bit prematurely, but they're at least trying to enjoy this beautiful new world that is in its infancy, but shows potential of making life better for everyone. And yet Callum, 
Callum, who was a major force in bringing about that world, in allowing it to come into being, in allowing the humans and elves to at least come together somewhat, cannot really be a part of that world. He is too broken down. He is too uncertain. That's potent. It reminds me a little bit of one of my favorite parts of Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. A part that the Peter Jackson movies, while great, really could have spent a little more time on. And that's how... Frodo is not the same. He saved the world, but he's not saved it for him. Callum feels somewhat similar. Now, of course, I mentioned Montagna and Emerson at the beginning of this video, in part because I do love to have my scholarly references. I am a scholar, after all. But it's not just my grandiose pretensions. There is a reason. They take two different perspectives. Montagna ultimately celebrates experience. He ultimately sees it as a gateway to a more intense and more visceral understanding of the world. Experience is not a teacher in the merely epigrammatic sense, the merely mundane sense, where it's mechanistic, like you stick your hand on a hot stove and learn not to do that again. Yeah, that's one part of it, but it's much more profound, much more capacious than that. Experience is constantly occurring. It's a stream that is ever eroding at the foundations of who we believed we are, and yet creating new continents through all the sedimentation. Little pieces and shreds of us break off one by one, and yet we're remade were transformed, and the world is constantly transforming around us. Ultimately, Montagna says this is why sticking to dogma and sticking to any abstract precepts, any absolute convictions about who you are and what you believe is ultimately a bit arrogant. Experience teaches humility. It teaches that however absolute and however clear and however unquestionable something might appear to you today, tomorrow it might look a bit different. Emerson believes this too. He takes a lot from Montagna's conception of experience, but he's not as confident and optimistic as Montagna. He believes, Montagna believes that you study something experientially, you study how it changes and shifts and how you change and shift in every passing moment, and you ultimately arrive at revelations that you would not have arrived at before, regardless of how much learning and wisdom and intelligence you have. Emerson believes something similar. He believes that the flowing, ever-burgeoning, ever-propelling stream of experience is ultimately to intense and too overwhelming to be comprehended by precepts and solid fixed thoughts about who we are and how the world is around us. We're constantly in a process of change and evolution, but he believes much less in the fact that we're going to arrive at some firm conclusion. Emerson knows that experience has a dark side. He knows that as incomplete as an orderly concept of the world based on precepts and preconceived notions is, those ideologies have a purpose. They give us a framework for thinking about the world. And yet, experience overwhelms those frameworks, it overwhelms those worldviews and systems of belief. And it doesn't always give us something firm and solid to replace them with. We might look back at our childhood home, a place we used to know so well, and not really know what to make of it. Experience is strange and weird. Emerson talks about how his son died. And 
it was a tragic loss, but he's a bit ashamed that he didn't feel as deeply about that loss as he believed he was supposed to. Experience is weird. And yet it must be faced. Rayla must decide how she is going to respond to her entire perception of herself. And her entire perception of herself as some good and just and moral person. What does she do now that that's been shattered? Because it has been shattered. She's been gone for two years, and there has been little purpose to her going. It's a bit of a shameful chapter in her life, but what does she do with that? Can she really position herself fully out of the grasp of this narrowly dogmatic elven system of preconceptions and beliefs that still, as we see, imprisons her? It still leaves her feeling that she needs to do everything by herself, that she needs to, in her mind, take care of those around her, even if it goes against their actual wishes. We see in Blood Moon Huntress, one of the best parts of that book, that this is a trait she fundamentally picks up from Runan more directly, and that whole culture indirectly. And it fails, as good as it sounds in abstract, in the world of experience, because it doesn't actually commit to what's best for the actual living people in her life. Callum doesn't feel protected, he doesn't feel reassured, he feels betrayed. And Rayla knows that. She has to decide how to respond to this fundamental fracturing of this foundation of belief that she once held. So what will she do? William James talks very eloquently about all those abstraction-loving people in philosophy classes who would prefer the pristine, orderly, sensible world of Plato and the like to the actual world of experience with how strange and bizarre and grotesque it can be and shame the actual world for not living up to that world of ideals whereas in reality philosophy if it has any function whatsoever needs to for James have some real distinct relation to the actual world as we experience it Rayla will have to decide how to go about interacting with the world as she experiences it. It's not going to be easy for her. It's not going to be simple, but I think she can do it. So anyway, thank you all for watching. If you liked yourself today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can, and you want to see more videos like this. I really do think a lot of the quality of Season 5 will come down to how deeply it's willing to go in regards to Rayla's malaise, in regards to these underlying issues that still linger in the back of her psyche. So anyway, tune in soon for next analysis. It will be coming soon. That I promise you. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.